Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm not sure. My wife and I just got back from a long trip to Cambodia and Vietnam late yesterday, so I'm, if I get my name wrong, you'll please excuse <laughs> me. Uh, but my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding uh, here at Dartmouth, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, Rabbi Marshall Meyer Great Issues Lecture uh, on social justice. Uh, I want to say just a few words uh, about Rabbi Meyer and this particular lecture because it's a very important one uh, in the calendar, uh, the annual calendar of the Dickey Center. Uh, this is, as I said, an annual event uh, which is made possible by a generous gift from Andrew and Marina Lewin. Uh, Andy Lewin is a member of the D Dartmouth class of 1981. Uh, he has two sons here now, Nate and Josh. I don't know if they're in the audience, but uh, uh, they're both Dartmouth undergrads and uh, both wonderful young people. Rabbi Meyer graduated from Dartmouth in 1952, and he founded the Seminario Rabbinico Latino Americano, a rabbinical school that became a center of conservative Judaism in Latin America. And during the years of the Argentinian military regime uh, of 1976 to 1982, Rabbi Meyer became a strong critic of the military government and its violations of human rights. He worked to save the lives of hundreds of people that were being persecuted by the regime and he visited prisoners in jails, among them the, the renowned journalist Jacobo Timmerman, who dedicated his book to the rabbi, who, and I quote, brought solace to Jewish, Christian, and atheist prisoners, unquote. This annual lecture, drawing on the Jewish value of Tichun Olam, repairing the world through social action, features a person who is truly helping to heal the world and expressing the values that Rabbi Meyer saw as the core of Judaism. And we indeed are very fortunate today to have such an individual uh, with us. Um, I'm very happy that uh, Jacqueline Novogratz is, is with us today. Uh, as I said, you'll soon see, I've had the pleasure of speaking with her a little bit uh, before, and uh, I think you'll find out exactly, you know, why uh, she's held in such high regard and, we, and was chosen as our social justice speaker. She began her career uh, in international banking with Chase Manhattan, founded a microfinance institution in Rwanda, and founded and directed, and directed the Philanthropy Workshop and the Next Generation Leadership Program at the Rockefeller Foundation. But she's perhaps best known uh, for her work as the founder and the CEO of the Acumen Fund uh, beginning in 2001. The Acumen Fund um, is a nonprofit <coughs> global venture fund that uses entre entrepreneurial approaches to solve the problems of global poverty. Acumen Fund invests patient capital to identify, strengthen, and scale business models that effectively serve the poor and champions this approach as an effective complement to traditional aid. Acumen Fund currently manages more than $50 million in investments in South Asia and East Africa, all focused on delivering affordable health care, water, housing, and energy to the poor in Pakistan, India, and Kenya. Jacqueline Novogratz serves on the board of the Aspen Institute and on the advisory councils of Stanford of the Stanford Graduate School of Business and MIT's Legatum Center. She has received numerous awards and is a frequent speaker at international venues such as the World Economic Forum, the Clinton Global Initiative, and TED. She received her BA at the University of Virginia 
and her MBA from Stanford. Please join me in welcoming Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome that was really nice, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm on. Thank you so much, um, Ken. That was really wonderful. And it, um, indeed, it really is an honor not only to be here, but to be here speaking um, on, in the spirit of social justice, in the spirit of what Rabbi Meyer stood for. Uh, I thought I'd start, though, um, with a story. And um, actually, before I do, let me also just ask my colleague, Catherine Boyce, to stand up, because She's one who helped get me here in the first place and has done such a great job as a uh, Dartmouth alum, a five, I guess, and um, yay, and uh, worked with Amy and Sharon and other people here at Dartmouth, and so thank you. Uh, but I thought I would start with this story that is the title of my book, uh, The Blue Sweater, because in many ways what I want to talk about today is not only how we change the world, but how we craft a life and how so, off, so many of our decisions are very deliberate decisions and other decisions sometimes feel like are being done for us or to us. Um, my story really is one that starts when I was a little girl. Um, but there was a particular incident when I was 10 and I was given this blue sweater that had zebras running across the front and Mount Kilimanjaro played strategically on the chest and um, wore it all the time including into my freshman year in high school when my adolescent curves were uh, filling out the geographical terrain <laughs> of the sweater in a different uh, way. I really believe that there's a seminal, unforgettable moment in every adolescent's life, um, often filled with complete humiliation, mortification. Mine was when I was in fr my freshman year of school and um, the my high school nemesis yelled across the hall in front of all the football players that the boys didn't have to go skiing on the mountains anymore. They could use the ones on my chest and um, sweater. And I was so humiliated that we threw the Goodwill, this, this sweater into the Goodwill, me and my mother. Fast forward 10 years, 5,000 miles. I left my career on Wall Street. I was starting the first microfinance bank in Rwanda, jogging through the hills of Kigali. And lo and behold, I see this little boy 10 years old, toothpick legs, wearing my sweater. And so I run up to the kid, grab him by the collar, turn it, and sure enough, there's my name written on the collar of the sweater. And so I have held that story as metaphor for how interconnected we as a, are as a world and how our action and our inaction can impact people we might never know, never meet every day of our lives. Um, so that was a big crossroads for me, just in terms of what is the universe saying. But I've had crossroads my whole life, as I know you all do and will, and I know that I will for the rest of my life. That's how it works. There's always another chapter. So I want to share a few of them with you. Since you guys are in school, most of you, um, my first one was the University of Virginia. The way that I got through school was being a bartender. I worked like a lunatic, uh, 40 hours a week, 100 hours a week in um, the summers. I told my mother and father that um, when I graduated with a degree in foreign affairs and economics, I was going to take a year off to continue my bartending trade and ski. And they thought that was a really bad idea, um, but they're really wise. And instead of forbidding me to do it, they said, you go do that, sweetheart, but why don't you at least go through the interview process and then you'll find out what you might like and you'll learn a lot about yourself. So I bought one suit and I put my um, resume dutifully in the boxes at the Career Center of, of places that would interview economics and foreign affairs people. And I had one interview, um, my first one, uh, for Chase Manhattan Bank. So I walk in the door and this really cute guy is sitting there as my interviewer and the first question after I introduce myself is, so tell me, why do you want to be a banker? I'm a really bad liar. And I looked at him straight in the face and I said, uh, well, actually, I don't want to be a banker. I want to change the world, but my mother and father are making me interview. And so I got this suit <laughs> and that's why I'm here. And, and he looked back and he's like, well, that is just too bad. Because if you got this job, you would be in 40 countries in the next three years. And you'd be learning all about the political and economic situations of those countries. I think it would be a pretty interesting experience for you. And I was like, oh, God. So I said, um, so, do you think we might start this interview again <laughs> over? 
And he's like, sure. I leave the room. I knock on the door. I come back in, introduce myself. And he says, so tell me, Jacqueline, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. Somehow or another, I got the job. Um, crossroads, first lesson. Sometimes you do what you think you do not want to do when your body says, just do it. Don't think, just do it, and tell the story that you need to do to get it. The next big crossroads for me was in Brazil. Um, I did go to 40 countries in, four, in three years. I did learn about the economic and political systems of the year, and I was blown away by what banking could do. This idea that you could take money, invest in a company, create jobs, new products, was really exciting to me. What was not exciting to me was that in a place like Brazil, which was the most colorful, alive, extraordinary place that I'd ever been in my life at that point, um, was also an incredibly divided society. And that elites could go to the banks and get money seemingly for whatever they wanted, and then my job was to write off hundreds of millions of dollars that was, were often irresponsibly approved. But most of the people in the country weren't welcome. In fact, they wouldn't even walk into the doors of the bank. So I went to my boss and said, you know, since we're writing off literally hundreds of millions of dollars given to the elites, and everywhere I look are really hardworking people in the favelas, maybe we would not only get paid back, but we would actually be keeping money inside the country if we changed our strategy and focused on the poor too. He literally gave me a book called The Innocent Anthropologist. And that was a moment where I realized that maybe there were other channels, other roads. But this was 1985 pre-internet, uh, really hard to figure out, is anybody out there focused on using the methods of banking for low-income people? And a friend of mine told me about this man who was, you can imagine, hardly known Muhammad Yunus. I uh, wrote him letters, it took 10 days to arrive, but I also found um, Ilabat, who had started the Self-Employed Women's Association in um, India. She didn't, um, I don't know if she got my letter or not. And I found a woman in, on Wall Street, Michaela Walsh, who had started something called Women's World Banking. And I begged her to hire me to do anything as long as I could get back to Brazil. And she said um, that was really great. She wanted to hire me for sure, but she had no job in Brazil. How about Africa? Um, Africa was not on my list of things that I wanted to do at that point, to be completely candid. But the second lesson for me was that prioritize what you want the most. What I wanted was this experience of learning how to lend to low-income people. And ultimately, while I was madly in love with Brazil, and I still am, I was going to go wherever they told me to go. And I did. And I don't regret it for a minute. Um, I ended up in the hills of Kigali, as you know from the first story, a place that I ultimately fell in love with. And there I met five women on this one in the middle right here. And, um, as a 25-year-old, and some of them were parliamentarians, and we took on this ridiculous idea that we were going to create a bank for women in a country which in 1986 had just passed, banned Napoleonic Code. Under the Napoleonic Code, women could not open a bank account without their husband's signature. So this was revolutionary. We knew we were creating history, and I was so young that I just figured, of course we can do it, and then, of course, we did. I learned. Um, that a small group of people really can create an institution, in this case of social justice. At the same time, I started a bakery um, with 20 unwed mothers who were called unlovingly prostitutes by the very conservative society. Um, this woman is named Agnes, and she was our first executive director. She was also one of the three first women parliamentarians in the country, and she should have really made history as a founding mother. But in 1994, when the Rwandan genocide happened, you can imagine not only what it felt to think about all the people that I knew, the people that I loved, all 20 women uh, who had started this bakery with me uh, were killed in the massacre. But um, most shockingly was that Agnes ended up being one of the major perpetrators. She was the Minister of Justice under the genocide regime. And so for four years in a row, 1996 till 2000, once a year, I would spend a month in Rwanda. I would talk to my friends who were survivors, friends who had seen their families being killed, um, friends who had been accused of being genociders, and then Agnes in the prisons, and another friend of mine who I call um, Prudence in the book, but she actually has a different name. Um, and when I'd sit knee to knee with Agnes, who ultimately was convicted of uh, the, the highest crimes of genocide, 
What I learned is that monsters actually do exist, but not in the way that we think they do. That what monsters really are, and I think that they live inside of every one of us, are the broken parts of ourselves. They're the fragments. They're the hurt parts. And it becomes really easy, particularly in times of economic and political turmoil, for demagogues to prey on those fragments, those hurt parts of ourselves, and point to others to blame them for the things that hurt inside us. And that's when terrible things can happen. And we certainly saw the worst of that in Rwanda. I learned so much in that whole period of my life. But three lessons I take with me in um, everything I do, but certainly in building Acumen Fund. And the first is that dignity is more important to the human spirit than wealth. So often you hear economists talk about what the poverty line is. Is it a dollar? Is it a dollar twelve? Is it a dollar seventy-one? And the truth is, I'm not sure what the economic sign is for how we measure poverty. The way I increasingly understand what it means to be impoverished is to not have choice, to not have decision making. And what was so striking through the, all of the demonstrations we saw in Egypt was while people were asking for jobs, the one word you heard over and over was dignity. And in my life I've seen that again and again and again. The second is that traditional charity and aid are not working. They are not going to solve the problems of poverty, in part because they don't look at the poor as full human beings that really want to solve all their own problems, but they come in with top-down solutions where they have the solution to what they think the problem is, and sometimes we get it right. Vaccines have been an incredible public health innovation in the world, not market-driven at all. But often we get it wrong and we end up creating dependence, which is the opposite of dignity. But this market ideology that we saw until we saw the financial markets um, really collapse uh, in, two years ago also is not the answer. Too often markets go right over low-income populations for good reason. It's really hard to reach them. No roads, no infrastructure, high levels of corruption. Uh, a population that only has a dollar or two dollars a day to make all of their economic decisions. And so for me it was all of these life experiences, banking, looking at philanthropy, seeing what happened in Moanda, that made us in 2001 decide that we were going to try to bring forth a new innovation for changing the way we do philanthropy but also changing the way we think about business so that it focuses not just on maximizing shareholder value but is seen really as a tool for how we solve problems. So we established Acumen Fund as a non-profit organization venture capital. We would take philanthropic money and then we would invest it. No giveaways. We would invest in those entrepreneurs who see the poor not as passive recipients of charity waiting for a handout, but as people who want to solve their problems. And when I started Acumen Fund, I thought well, we'd have to invest in companies for five or seven years. That's what patience meant. What we're learning is that it's more like eight, ten, maybe fifteen years. But if you have the patience, the audacity, the determination to hang in there with an entrepreneur, who really has a vision of what it takes to bring basic goods and services to low-income people. And you provide a lot of management support to that person, to that organization. And then you start to measure the impact of the work that you're doing, not just the profits. We actually can really start to, to change some of these problems in a big way. I'm going to give you examples later, but just to give you where we work, just the basics. We don't work on exports or crafts. We work on water, healthcare, energy. Um, agricultural inputs and increasingly we're about to launch uh, education. We just need to raise a little bit more money for it. And our focus areas are Pakistan, India, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and we're just opening offices in um, Ghana and Nigeria. But here's how it works. So you see this guy in the yellow shirt. His name is Amitabha Sidangi. He's a good friend of mine. He's exactly my age. A lot of the same frustrations I have. He worked with farmers in India. Uh, for 25 years. There are over 150, almost 200 million small-scale farmers in India, so people working on two acres of land, God bless you, or less. Um, and the problem that he saw was, again, the commercial markets had bypassed the farmers altogether. They weren't making inputs, certainly not in the irrigation systems for low-income farmers, and the charities would bring the 
the goods and services they thought the farmers needed, but often at the wrong time, in the wrong quantity, for the wrong crops. He was fascinated with Israel. Israel had developed drip irrigation, this way of taking um, in, in, in scarce water lands, this way of taking a little bit of water through a very thin tube with microtube, microtubes that went out to the stalk of every plant. It would just drip water. And so you could literally grow plants in the desert. And so if you would stand and see Israel to your left and Jordan to your right, you would see desert here and fields of emerald green there. But as I said, drip irrigation was, was built for large-scale commercial farms, not the one-acre um, holder farmer. Amitama started to look at the farmers as customers. What would he take, he thought, if he could innovate that technology so that the farmers could afford it and would value it? The first was miniaturization. Farmers are the most risk-averse population on the planet for good reason. Everything they own, all of their family survival depends on the lands. And they have been cheated and played with for years and years and years and years and years. So he knew he had to take this, compartmentalize this technology down so that it was a quarter acre. So that he would go to farmers and say, don't risk your whole land, risk one quarter acre of it. Second was that it had to be so affordable that they could borrow or pay for it and see their investment repaid in one harvest with profit. And third, it had to be incrementally and infinitely expandable. So with the profits from the first harvest, they would buy their second quarter acre and their third and the fourth and so on and so on and so on. We invested in 2003 and um, they've since sold about 350,000 systems. That's almost two million people now. And in some villages we're seeing um, family members' income go from one to two dollars a day to five to six dollars a day, which is truly moving out of poverty with enormous choice. It's an incredible innovation, so incredible that we decided to then work with Amitabha to create a for-profit company. We own half of it, they own half of it. This year they have about five million dollars in sales. We got our first dividend payment, which we're very proud of, and we believe that this is going to grow to a 25 million dollar company, which is really interesting when their average customer makes about a dollar a day. We also have been looking at replicating it, and of course, because Acumen never takes the easy path, we decided with Amitabha to go from India to Pakistan. And this guy here, Dr. Sonakan Gadani, is actually from the Dalit caste, the lowest untouchable caste um, in Hinduism, but he's from a group that was so remote in the Thar region, the desert region in the south of Pakistan, um, that when the two countries divided, the Hindu population in this particular area stayed back in Pakistan, and they're still there today. And so Sono is working with people who've been living with indentured servitude and really very, very, very difficult conditions, and is now working with Amitabha from India to bring this technology across the, the countries to um, Pakistan. And there was this day a couple of years ago when I was with Dr. Sono, it's 100, no, 120 degrees. Um, we drove eight hours through this monochromatic desert, and we see this man who reminds me of my dad, Rajan, he's really tall, and he shows us these seven-foot sunflowers growing in the desert. And he tells me it's his first time. He's got 50 grandchildren, 12 children, 50 grandchildren. In every other season, they would have to walk for two days with all their animals during the dry season to work on other people's farms for 50 cents a day. And now um, he can send all of those uh, grandchildren to school, and you start to see what this means not only to our earth, but to our children. I think the social entrepreneurs, those entrepreneurs that are solving problems with issues, with business, are, are also holding our deepest human values inside themselves. Sam Goldman understands what the power of light, and he's been innovating around bringing solar energy to low-income people across India, and has uh, just reached their two millionth person. David Kuria decided he wanted to bring toilets, public sanitation, to Kenya. Now in Kenya, one in two people have no access to public sanitation. And so bringing toilets is really about changing behaviors completely. And so he knew that in building these toilets, he had to use beauty because we care about beauty, we care about comfort, we care about status as human beings. But beauty wasn't enough. Because when I lived there in the 1980s, toilets were dirty, they were dangerous. It's where prostitution and drugs were found, not sanitation. 
So he has people always dressed in uniforms cleaning so you feel safe. He, has, it, it, he charges about six or seven cents to use it. Ancillary services, you can get your shoes shined, there's little food courts, people can make money. But the real innovation is he pumps rock and roll music in uh, the inside of these toilets. So they kind of beckon people and they're fun. You, you walk in and people are dancing around. Um, <laughs> This year, six million uses. Next year, we're looking at 10 million. And, and Tanzania and Uganda are seeing this as a model for ways of bringing public sanitation to markets where there's very little trust, high open defecation areas. Inclusion, this is a, a picture of a woman who's just given a baby at LifeSpring, which is a maternal health company. Acumen owns half of this company, and the government of India owns the other half of the company. The insight was that low-income women want choice as well. And in India, you can choose the free government hospital, which is a viable, it's a viable option. But it's a difficult option, and it's never free. You still have to pay bribes to work your way through the system, or the private sector, which is incredibly expensive, or have the baby at home. LifeSpring brings another choice, which is a low-cost, affordable option, where, again, beauty, the whole place is painted so pink, you almost need sunglasses to walk in. The women love it. Private stalls, um, real input. But what we learned from this is that demand wildly exceeded supply. And not only demand from people who could afford it, but from women who can't afford it. And so we've worked with LifeSpring to set up a foundation so that we can extend services to the truly indigent, as well as people who are making one or two or three dollars a day. I know that Dr. Arvind from Arvind High Hospitals um, is coming to speak to you all in a few uh, weeks, I guess, maybe months. But Arvind Hospital is one of my favorite social innovation enterprise in the world. It was sta started by a man named Dr. Venkateswamy. Um, Dr. Venkateswamy started Arvind when he was 58 years old. He had, had to retire from the civil service and he decided another goal would just be then. He would eradicate blindness in India in his lifetime. Um, why not? And what he did was bring in a just-in-time approach to delivering eye surgery. So the surgeon stands at the operating table and the people who are working at Arvin bring the patient to the doctor. The doctor does the operation. There's another group that brings them out. And in a day, each surgeon does on average 80 surgeries. In the United States, you do six. Um, but Arvin uh, now sees a million people a year. They have the same infection rates, the same failure rates as they do in the United States. It's an extraordinary innovation for the poor. Uh, Dr. Venkateswamy, who's really been a mentor to me, died unfortunately a few years ago, but the institution continues and it's a real beacon of hope. And excellence. When Sumitomo, um, which is a chemical company in Japan, decided that it wanted to take its malaria, new malaria bed net um, technology, which impregnated a, a polyethylene-based fiber with a natural insecticide, to Africa, there was real worry about where would we find the African entrepreneur who could do this technology transfer and manufacture at the, the standards that they needed, that they'd seen in Asia. But many people, including Acumen Fund, felt here was a real opportunity. 92% of people who get malaria are in Africa, so why were 100% of these nets being manufactured in Asia? We financed the technology transfer in 2002 and worked with the company for many years. And now A to Z Manufacturing in Arusha, Tanzania employs 8,000 people, mostly women. Last year they made 30 million nets, which provides coverage for almost 60 million people. It's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of total global production. And when, you, when I take people into that factory, it changes their perception of what Africa is capable of. And that's what we need to do more of. We need to bet on those winners and grow them to a size that we start changing the minds of what people are capable of in the world. But all of this is about investing. All of this is about markets. All of this is about innovation. But the real lesson, which goes to social justice, goes to healing the world, is about people. It's about leadership. And I think that you guys represent the future. And the thing that we need to think about and talk about most of all is just that. Acumen and my life is really filled with being worked able to work with some of the most incredible leaders on the planet. This is Javad Aslam. We have a fellows program at Acumen Fund. We typically, typically get five to seven hundred applications for uh, ten spots from 65 countries every year. 
Javad was a Pakistani Amer is a Pakistani American um, who made his life in commercial real estate. And in nine, after 9-11, he decided he wanted to go to Pakistan and contribute to build, to show what was possible in that country. We worked with him as a fellow, and his dream was to work with another one of our investments, um, uh, Saiban, which was building low-cost housing for people in Karachi. Javad wanted to do it in Lahore, which is a, um, more like Washington, D.C. If Karachi is New York, Lahore is like D.C. and or Boston. And he took this um, barren piece of land. It looked like the moon. It was about 18 kilometers outside of Lahore proper. But the, so much of what these guys represent is imagination, dreaming the, the possible out of the impossible. And we were so excited, but um, Javad, like the kind of entrepreneur we believe in, refused to pay bribes. Patient capital allowed him not to, but it took a year and a half to register that land. Not because there was some fancy guy up on top, but there was this kind of dweeby 31-year-old skinny registrar who wouldn't let him do it without a bribe. And so we pressured, we waited, he finally got it. And then our next big challenge was there was one house. And it was a beautiful house, but nobody was signing up for it because low-income people had been ripped off so many times that no one trusted that they, this, this housing development would work. So I went to visit on this particular day. The monsoons had left the rice paddy in the field, flooded. And so the only way that you could get to the house was to take off your shoes and walk through the mud. And it was a beautiful night, and the sun was just about to set. And I realized that I have all these young people on my team, and it's not such a great idea to be in some of these rural areas after dark. So it was time that we should go home. And so we were kind of walking across the muddy path to get to the village to where our uh, car was parked, and suddenly we hear this boom. And before you know it, we're in the middle of a crossfire. Fifty boys with machine guns and normal guns, and they're shooting, and we can't run because we're in the rice paddy. And um, needless to say, it was terrifying. And the good thing was nobody got hurt. Um, there were these robbers, and all the boys came out and eventually did get them. Um, we were really shaken up. But we went back the next day. And what happened in going back the next day, not for any other reason but that this was our work, was that the people in the village started to realize that Javad and his team and all of us were serious. We were going to come back. We were going to show up. And I think too often in the world today, people get tired and they don't show up. And probably at the, the essence of leadership is having that courage to show up. So then we got started. It is slow, but people started buying. And today, um, 2,000 people live in this model village. Uh, it's the first uh, organization like this of its kind outside of Lahore. It's beautiful. And it has encouraged the first commercial mortgages in the country. And because we talk about it, while it's only a small project, um, the government of Punjab, which is the largest state in Pakistan, worked with us to create an expediting unit inside government so that next time when you build a housing development, you don't have to work with the dweeby little registrar. You can bypass him and go right to the registration and get this stuff moving. And so Javad is changing the world. When I really understood, though, what he does and what leadership is and what we call moral imagination at Acumen Fund, this ability to put yourself in another person's shoes, build from that perspective, happened last May. I happened to be in Lahore, right next to two Ahmadi mosques. The Ahmadis are a particular sect of Islam. Uh, the only Nobel laureate to ever come out of Pakistan is an Ahmadi. But fundamentalists think that they are not really Muslim. And so um, suicide bombers attacked these two mosques during Friday prayer while the people were all inside. Over 100 people were killed, and many people were wounded. And you could feel the tremors of fear and resistance just pulling up through the whole country, certainly through Lahore. The very next morning, I went out to see Javad again. And this time, it struck me, uh, which I had known before, but I really focused on the fact that there's only one mosque in Saiban. And I asked Javad, you know, here's this, this little village now, literally 12 miles away from where these mosques had been attacked. And I said, how do you guys navigate having one mosque? Because this community is really diverse. Not only Sunni Shia, but within the Sunni, the Sunni, Sunni Islam, many different sects, where you see a lot of the, the inter-ethnic fighting. 
And he said it was really hard. But the community came together for over a year. We fought out who would get to use the mosque. And ultimately, we decided that we would select three of the most respected imams in the community from different sects. But everyone would pray together. And on Fridays, that's just what they do. And it's another small story. But it's the kind of story that if you talk to a big group of people in Pakistan, it shows what's possible and people believe. Like I said before, your generation has some of the biggest problems that any generation has ever faced in front of you. And yet, I honestly can say in the 30 years of my professional career, I've never encountered a generation that I believe in as much as yours. But you guys think about it. You have the financial crisis. You have natural disasters all around the world. Just in the past six months, I've been in Pakistan during the floods. We have an, a chapter uh, in Tokyo that's really reeling because of what's happening in Japan. And there are risings, revolutions, rebellions everywhere. And we don't know how they're going to play out. I'm an optimist, obviously. And I think we are on a trajectory towards more inclusion, towards seeing each other in ways we've never seen each other before. But what we need is a whole new set of skills. What we need is not to just tweak our economic systems at the margins, do business a little differently, do government a little differently. We need to start imagining systems that really integrate our values into the way we do business and government and understand that they've got to work together. In many ways, I think that what we're seeing now is the extension of the civil rights movement not only that occurred in the United States in the 50s and 60s, but what we started to see around the world with African independence and Indian independence and, and movements towards greater freedom in East and West Europe. I had this great opportunity in my life uh, to work with the child psychologist, Dr. Robert Coles. Now, Dr. Robert Coles, when people were making the decisions whether they would stand on the sidelines during the Freedom Summer rats, Freedom Summer, or actually go in, he was one of the guys that went in. And his job was to work with some of the young people who were the first ones to desegregate schools in the South. And one particular girl that he talks about was a little girl, six years old, named Ruby Bridges. She was actually the first girl in the United States to desegregate any school, and it happened to be in New Orleans. And he said that every day he would watch little Ruby, fully dignified in these beautiful little puffy dresses. She would walk through this phalanx of angry people screaming at her, calling her a monster. And she would walk with her head held high, and he, it looked like she was talking to people. And he would say, Ruby, what are you saying? And she would say, I'm not saying anything, Dr. Coles. And finally, after a few days of this, he said, Ruby, I can see you talking to the people. What are you saying? And she said, Dr. Coles, I'm not saying anything. I'm praying. And he said, well, so then tell me, what are you praying? And she said, I'm praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. At six years old, Ruby Bridges had the kind of moral imagination all of us need to integrate into ourselves so that we can work across lines of difference, not from a place of judgment or otherness, but to start to imagine a world where every single one of us really does have access to the goods and services that we need to make change in our lives so that we can really extend that fundamental assumption that all men are created equal to every man, woman, and child on this planet. I end with the words of another Acumen Fund fellow, a young man named Joseph Atbiarahanga, who grew up in a rural Ugandan farming community. And we placed him in western Kenya, less than 200 miles away from where he grew up. And his job was to work with the low-income farmers and figure out a marketing system to sell them hybrid seeds. And at the end of his time, he said, I was so humbled by this work because I thought I would be good at it. I thought I knew what it meant to be a farmer. And he said, but I made so many mistakes. He said, you know, in some ways, if I learned anything, it's that leadership is like a panicle of rice. Because at the height of the harvest, rice is green, it's verdant, it's it's beautiful and bold, and it reaches out to the heavens. And he said, but right before you pick, pick the rice, right before it's ready, it bends down with great humility, and it touches the earth with a great sense of gratitude. And I think it's that 
audacity to believe that we can do anything combined with humility to realize that we need each other. That is at the core of the kind of leadership that will really bring about the kind of social justice that this um, lecture series represents. Robert Kennedy once said that few of us have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And it is in the total of all those acts that the history of this generation will be written. As I said just a few minutes ago, from the bottom of my heart, I have never seen a generation like yours with the spirit and the intellect and the sense of the possible and the connection to people around the world. And we're expecting a lot of you, and we need all of you. But the real lesson is just start. No matter what it is that you dream of doing, just start and let the world work teach you because there is a big, beautiful life out there if you only dare to live it out loud. So I wish you all Godspeed, and I thank you very much for this afternoon. microphone circulating, so please raise your hand and then I'll wait to ask your question until you have a microphone. And according to our traditional practice, uh, students get preference with questions. So please, come on. Who would like to be first? Yep. Do you have a mic on? I have a mic. Um, like Thanks for your speech. I would just uh, like to ask you about, is there any relationship between this model of bank you have with Mohamed Yunus, the Nobel Prize winner in uh, a couple years ago? Well, the first bank that I started in Rwanda, it's called Dutedembre, um, which still exists, was absolutely modeled on the Grameen Bank. Uh, in many ways, Acumen Fund stands on the shoulders of Dr. Yunus and others like him. But whereas a micro loan tends to be thirty to a hundred dollars, our average investment is a million dollars. We invest in entrepreneurs who are really focused on changing the overall system. So we've invested sixty million dollars in about fifty-five companies, and um, what's been exciting is to see thirty-five thousand jobs now and tens of millions of people get access to goods and services. So he is a friend. Um, he infuses what it is that we do, um, but it's, I, I think of Acumen as the next chapter, um, building on microfinance. Next question um, just from reading the blue sweater, it seems that uh, the idea of patient capital has really been successful in the, de uh, in the developing world. Do you think it could be applied to the developed world, the United States, underserved region, like rural regions and uh, urban regions? I definitely do. In fact, we're talking about that at Acumen. And, um, you know, one of my dreams is that my board's probably going to kill me, um, but is uh, something that we didn't anticipate is that chapters are starting to develop around the world um, for Acumen Fund. And um, you might ask me, you know, what's a chapter? I'm actually learning myself, but essentially, the young people, young professionals, including students, We'll get together in a community and uh, raise money for Acumen and do Acumen 101s and case studies and business plan competitions. And they really feel a sense of belonging and connected to, connectedness to Acumen. And so we've been talking to them about what they want and what they need. And a number of them are really interested not only in learning about patient capital investing, but trying it. And one of my dreams. Uh, over the next few years would be to encourage them to raise money if it's Chicago for Acumen and then investing in Chicago and then teaching us what's working, what's not working because I actually think that the, it's the lessons that are so important. Um, I just spoke to a group of young people in Norway. They've not yet started a chapter but I think they might and they want to focus on the immigrant populations of Norway. So we have so much to learn from each other as a world. And we've got to get away from the paradigm that there are rich countries and there are poor countries. Instead, and I think this really applies to anybody who goes to Dartmouth, 
we're starting to see a world emerge, which is really two worlds. The global elite, who are more like each other across national boundaries, often than they are the, the, the disadvantaged people in their own societies. And with that eliteness, which is a word a lot of people hate, but I can't think of another truer world in this open global world, have a real responsibility to figure out what that means and what the systems are that will bring everybody up. And so, um, yes, there's a place for patient capital really everywhere on the planet. Um, and it's a question of, which I think will go to what are the new products, taxation systems, incentives. Um, but since we're just learning how to do it, we're early days. Um, so, um, just kind of going off of the question that was asked a minute ago about microfinance versus the mission of Acumen Fund. Um, so, Acumen and the concept of investing in entrepreneurs that are going to have a larger impact over a greater population is sort is sort of like the next chapter of how how we can like affect greater change and really change the systems. What would you say, or do you see still? What do you say, what do you see as the role for? microfinance presently in connection to that to that kind of larger systemic change like how could you um, have a microfinance sort of institution that would be more progressive or would kind of you know make that bridge right into the new well don't get me wrong I'm, I'm not saying that patient capital is is better than it's different than in in a way another construct that might be helpful here is that when Eunice used to talk about um, microfinance in the 80s and 90s, he would say that credit is a human right. We have to figure out a way to get a reasonably affordable credit to every person on the planet. And what we're now looking at is, I agree, water, clean water is a human right. It's really complicated. And we're doing a terrible job getting it to everyone on the planet. 1.5 billion people have no access to water, clean water. In India alone, 400 million people have limited access and 200 million people have no access. And so we got to get away from the conversations of water is a human right or water is a scarce environmental co commodity that needs to be priced. And we have to have a more rational, thoughtful conversation about, well, what does it take to price it, distribute it, make it, avail make it available, uh, make it accessible and make it clean so that everybody can get access to some of it. But for those of us who use a lot of it, agriculture, mining, um, big industry, we need to charge them more. We need to take, we need to be much more creative about the pricing structures. So microfinance would be, if, if you put up water, health, housing, education, credit is another piece of it. And so that's where I see it. We work with a lot of microfinance institutions where um, individuals will need to borrow money so that they can purchase the goods that we're selling. Um, and that's a whole other conversation because sometimes it's done well and sometimes it's not done well at all. Yeah. Um, okay, so you ended your talk with the advice to just start. So can you talk about um, talk more about how you started and how you kind of got into contact with the people that you um, started working with like on the grounds in India and Pakistan? Sure. I mean, always I've just started. I mean, literally when I um, did uh, Rwanda when I was 25, I literally, you know, got to the country for three weeks with my suitcase and I was like, I'm staying. Um, and I just started introducing myself to people and I could barely speak French, which was the only language uh, then. But even now with Acumen Fund. So what happened with Pakistan, when we started Acumen Fund in April of 2001, we just turned 10. Um, in April 2001, there was one employee at Acumen. And, um, well, th there were no employees. There was me. Um, <laughs> with big dreams. The, the, um, but we were only going to work in India and East Africa because we didn't have a very big team. You know? And um, then 9-11 happened. Uh, by then, we had four, four team members, uh, including me. 9-11 shook everybody's uh, foundations, obviously. For Acumen, um, 
we were moving into offices that day at Ground Zero. And so um, there was this whole sense of loss additionally. And then I personally lost four uh, friends in the, in the, in the uh, disaster. And so on, April, on September 12th, the four of us got together at Rockefeller offices and we said, you know, what do we do? We can't be in the bucket brigade. We're just starting to raise money for Acumen. We'd only gotten three of the 20 people we needed by December to give us money. I was really afraid that everybody would want to just give money to New York and forget about the rest of the world. And I felt that this was the moment of to be responsible for the rest of the world. So what we knew we could do was move fast. And I don't even know why we decided to do it. It was just intuition. But I was like, get on the phone. Dan Toole, who was my first COO, um, had negotiated with the Taliban in his work at UNICEF. So, and I, because of my Rwanda days, we knew a lot of people in conflict resolution, people who'd worked in post-conflict uh, societies as well. So we got on the phone, and we pulled together this crazy group of people that included Jessica Stern, who was President Bush's uh, main advisor on terrorism, um, a Wall Street Journal reporter who had interviewed every jihadi from, Qadda from Gaddafi to Khomeini to um, bin Laden, and um, another UN guy who knew people in the Taliban. We put, pulled them together for a round table. The end of this round table, and the round table was what is terrorism, what is fundamentalism, who are the jihadis, um, wh how can we get smarter as a world? That was October 4th. The end of that night, and it was like a six hour meeting that was supposed to be, I'd promised the president of the Rockefeller Foundation we would be out the door at six, because um, it started at four, and at like quarter of 11, I was t t telling these really eminent people, you have to sneak down the stairs, because if we get caught, you know, crazy. But um, at the end of that meeting, someone said, Jacqueline, if you had a million dollars, what would you do in response to 9-11? And I very sure-footedly said, I would go to the Muslim world, and I would build institutions of civil society so that people could see the capacities of individuals within those societies, and they could see them too. And um, one of the great lessons of my life is be careful what you say out loud. Um, because that was a Tuesday, I think, and on Friday, sure enough, I got a million dollar check. And I was like, oh no. And literally, I pulled the team together and I was like, so guys, where exactly is the Muslim world? And uh, how do you build a civil society institution? Because <laughs> we're in. And that, that was, so now we're in you know, November, January, the week that Danny Pearl, I don't know if you guys remembered this, he was the journalist who got beheaded, of course, I showed up, um, I opened the newspaper, and there was like the picture of his beheading, and I was like, oh my God. I didn't know a single person, except I had heard about Roshani Zafar, who started this microfinance bank because she was an acolyte of Muhammad Yunus's, called Roshani, hey, who do you know that's doing really interesting things in Pakistan? And before the week was over, I met three really critical people. Roshani, Tasneem Siddiqui, the guy in housing, and Syed Babar Ali, one of the most eminent businessmen most respected businessmen in the country. And Babar, who I went on to have this great love affair with because he's you know, 83 and full of energy and just so respected, and his wife, um, I, uh, I, he said to me, I'll help you here, but what you need to know is that nobody's going to trust an American coming to Pakistan. So just keep your head really low. Just keep showing up. And, make, and build a few things that Pakistanis can, can see and can respect. And over time, they will respect you. And now on our 10th anniversary globally, um, what's been so exciting to me is this year we are raising a million dollars from Pakistanis for Pakistan. We have 350 members of, of 350 Pakistanis in the Pakistan community. And we're really seen as a major player inside Pakistan. A very wise ambassador, actually, uh, at the beginning, when I confessed to him that I really didn't know very much about Islam, and I really didn't know very much about Pakistan, and I certainly didn't know very much about terrorism. What was I doing? Was I being irresponsible? He said, you know what I've learned in my life? He said, if you have the courage to go places that other people won't go, and you really go there, and you really stay there, pretty soon you're going to be the expert. 
And the funny thing is, I still am learning so much about that country. I have fallen in love with it. But I can stand proudly and talk about it in ways that I've found that I've been to more places in that country than many of the elites. And that gives me great credibility too. But I didn't know a single thing when I went. But I knew I didn't know a single thing I, when I went. And so I just started and I let the work teach me. And I just think that that's how the world changes. Because uh, there are no roadmaps for the things that are new. All right. Um, so you've talked a lot about kind of capitalism and, and, and investing and using money and all that stuff. Um, it's been kind of an interesting body of literature that's come out recently that capitalism is not getting the job done. Capitalism is not providing the goods that the people in poor countries need. And I guess I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were on kind of that. I personally am a fan of capitalism. I think investing in money is really doing great things as you are demonstrating. But I guess I just wanted to hear what you thought about this body of literature that's come up saying that capitalism is crap, essentially. You mean what Naomi Klein is? writing about the <laughs> so Naomi and I are good friends um, the the I think that we've got to reframe the conversation that it's too easy to say capitalism doesn't work or capitalism is the answer we're at a moment of real chaos in the world um, the truth is this free market thing that we have going has actually taken more people out of poverty in the last 15 years really than any economic history and any, every, any economic system in history. Um, that's irrefutable. So we're seeing enormous movement of people. And at the real margins, we're seeing a slight uh, convergence. While there's a, a major divide between rich and poor, it's actually getting t a little bit tinier. The big difference I see is that we can see each other in ways that we have never been able to see each other before. And that, we, don't e we haven't even begun to understand what that means. And as a result, it certainly feels like nothing's working. It feels like we're at a really violent stage in the world's progression. And yet, never have we lived in such peaceful times as we do now. Never have we had less bloodshed or less wars going on at ever, any given moment. And so, my question is, how do we focus on the good news, but recognize not just looking at numbers and what these absolute means, absolutes mean, but how can we build systems where people can um, really feel a sense that they're being included? It's this feeling of being excluded, I think, that is where so many of the problems are. And when you go back to this question about the United States, um, you look at the stats of the United States, and this is where poverty can't be measured in income. The, it's, un, it's something like 90% of Americans have air conditioners in their home unless they live in a really cold part of the country. Um, everyone has a cell phone. Every family has a car. Uh, you know, poor, the poor in other countries look at that and say, well, that doesn't look very poor. But Bangladeshi men who make $2 a day have a greater life expectancy, like by 11 years, than black Americans at any le income level, at black males in America at any income level. So we need to get more sophisticated about the way we think of our systems and get away from what's the future of capitalism to what's the future of how we solve our problems as a world. And can we dare to imagine a world where everyone has opportunity if that looks like the world that we want to live in, and it's certainly the world I want to live in, um, then how do we use the tools at our disposal, capital, government, philanthropy, in such a way that we can do a better job than we've been doing? Um, because I think if we just talk about capitalism or socialism, we do ourselves a real disservice and we actually make ourselves small at a moment where we need to actually make ourselves really big. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my, my first is, is, is a, a suggestion I would like to give is uh, one of the pictures you showed about Rwanda. Uh, it has a picture uh, of one of the women on the uh, right hand um, who's wearing some of the flags of the people who committed genocide. And it's hurtful to see the picture that way. You may crop and remove uh, those images. Uh, and the second is a question. Uh, 
I saw that you have a fellowship program and it, it does include East Africa, but uh, you're working of and focusing on people who have been in a business for, th for three years. And uh, my question is, uh, what about these startups? Because currently we know that um, if you can uh, bail and uh, well identify a project or a business that have been going on for the three years can also be able to identify a good successful business at the startup level. What about the startups and uh, what you may be planning for that? Um, both, le let me first take your suggestion. Um, and I absolutely hear what you're saying and I apologize for the hurt in it. The reason I put that up there is because in 1986, people in Rwanda um, talked about La Belle Epoque. This was the great time. And people said many of the things that they say now about Rwanda. It was an easy place to work. Things got done. There was no corruption. Um, these women were building an institution of social justice. And they were the women, as you know, who were part of, not all of them, um, half the women that I worked with got killed. In fact, Annie Mugwaneza, who was our, our founder, was killed in the first hour of the genocide. She was specifically gone after. And what's so painful to me is Agnes was part of going after her, even though they worked together. And so I, I really want to think about what that means in terms of speaking to truth and not, and not um, dismissing, but also not hiding um, but, and not hurting. So I, I really I'll think about what you had to say, and I apologize for any feeling you have there. On the second, um, we try to avoid startups. And the reason we try to avoid startups is because we're making big investments, a million dollars, and we're looking at what it takes to grow them to significant levels. Our, our companies that are successful are reaching hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Um, we have broken that rule a few times because it's so hard to find these companies that work. But we, don't, we try not to, to do it very often because we've got to focus on what we can be good at. And when we've done particularly small, well, which by their nature they are, but undercapitalized startups, um, which we did for a little while, the failure rate was really, really high. And so we're so focused on successes um, that we have, as a policy, we don't do it. In reality, we've done it a few times. So. You um, uh, mentioned a difficulty that you had with registration in Pakistan and how the Pakistani government um, uh, had to intervene and um, to enable you to register effectively and get the uh, development that you had going started. So I wondered just generally the I issues that you've had with governments around the world, whether they've been more receptive and supportive or whether you've felt more as if you've had to bypass regulation and Obviously, governments in the developing world have a role to play with helping these things get off the ground and maintaining them, maintaining order. But do you feel like private initiative is the way to go? Or do you feel like there's definitely been... A role for a, government? I mean, like, do you feel like government has been living up to its role? I don't think anybody has been living up to I its real potential. Um, we've, you know, I was with a... Uh, a guy in Nigeria recently um, whose father made his money in oil and now he's a hedge fund trader and um, also does a lot of mining in Sierra Leone and Liberia and he said you know the whole problem in Africa is aid and if we could just get rid of aid Africa would be fine and I said you know I'm a no apologist for aid but um, I really have a hard time hearing that from an oil guy given that Nigeria has seen an oil spill on the, at the, the size of the Exxon Valdez every year for the last 50 years. We don't hear about it. It all gets hidden because of big companies paying off government. Um, everybody's winning except for everybody in the country. And so it's too easy to throw stones. I, I think that government, I do think all these sectors need to change and are changing. That's the good news. We're seeing real change. For us, I mean, for our strategy, which I think is not the only right strategy, but is certainly a right strategy, 
is to believe that private initiative and private resources will not provide the only answer, but will, but will and can lead the way to how we solve public problems. And so what I didn't understand when we started Acumen was that the road to grow, growth, the road to scale, often has to come with government. Um, but the innovation, government is often way too big and bureaucratic to really incubate innovation. So the example I'll give there is in the ambulance sector in India. Up until a few years ago in India, 90% of the people in ambulances were dead, which is not so different than what it was like in the United States until the late 1960s. Um, very corrupt industry again. If you wanted to go to the hospital, you would call a taxi. You only really call the ambulance for going to the morgue. Um, government had very little incentive to change the whole industry uh, because big government contracts were given to charities, often through bribery, et cetera, et cetera. So four guys in um, Mumbai decide that they're going to create a better ambulance company. No corruption, uh, service for all. So if you're taken to an expensive hospital, you pay. If you're taken to a free public clinic, it's free. And they painted a bright yellow. They also come into some of these same issues. They call trying to get a good number like 111, 999, 311, and um, they won't pay any bribes. So the guy gives him 1298. Um, really hard. People are looking for the 12 on their um, dial in panic. So part of their marketing is it's 1298, it's not 1298. Um, what's been phenomenal. Uh, we invested, we bought 30% of the company when they had nine ambulances. A lot of people thought, why so small, they'll never make a dent, etc. When the terrorist attacks happened in November of um, 2008, I happened to be in New York watching CNN, it was Thanksgiving Day. And what was extraordinary to me was in all of the footage in front of the burning hotels, there were our ambulances. And that was another moment where I thought, you can really change the world. The Indian government saw it too. And from that moment, um, four big states in India then decided to contract with 1298 to bring those, gov those private services to the public. Bihar, Rajasthan are two of those states, two of the poorest states in the country. And so what started off as a private company now is a private-public partnership. And they've grown from nine ambulances to 355 ambulances. Uh, almost 1,500 employees and they'll go to 3,000 in the next couple of years. So our job also gets more difficult because now we need to learn how to navigate government more effectively and work with them on, on really growing complex companies. So I would say that government's been a real partner to us. Um, but we don't start, we don't go in and introduce ourselves to every government official. We go in through the private sector and as things grow, when needed, reach out to government. If I could just follow up on that to ask, uh, Dambisa Moyo was here about a year ago, and I'm sure you're familiar with her views, very critical of traditional aid programs in Africa. And I was wondering if you might comment on her thoughts uh, you know, in aid programs in Africa as you see them now. Yeah, um, Dambisa, I mean, ironically, Dambi I count, as Catherine knows, Dambisa and Naomi among my friends, which is kind of interesting. Um, Dambisa will, in private, say it. You know, she says, I point out the problems. You're focused on building the solutions. I think it, there's truth to what she says about corruption, about the aid programs gone wrong. No doubt. And that a lot of, the, a lot of aid until the, the, the falling of the uh, Berlin Wall and after was driven by political considerations. That's all true. Um, but there actually have been some major accomplishments because of aid. Um, certainly in emergencies, I look at what some of the big aid agencies are doing. Um, and they're extraordinary, including the United States government and military, ex extraordinary. Uh, like I said before, vaccines, I think it's, you'd be hard pressed to call that anything but a success. And that's a top down, that's by necessity top down. Um, so I think that Dambisa has a very important voice in the world because it's kind of shocked people into confronting this. Uh, and I think we need more people that uh, have the 
the stubbornness, if you will, and determination to focus on the solutions part of this and not just say, it's broken, th throw it out the window. That's not going to get us where we need to go. Questions? Yeah, please. Uh, you mentioned Nigeria, and I was just wondering, um, how do you save a country with the Acumen Fund, uh, like Nigeria, whose main resource is oil, and uh, which lacks the infrastructure to uh, get it from the large multinational organizations like Shell and Chevron? Um, well, first, we. One thing I've learned is we don't save anybody um, uh, at all, and our purpose isn't to um, to save. But um, Nigeria's greatest resource is its entrepreneurs. It's one of the most entrepreneurial cultures on the planet. And what's broken is is. You know, Paul Collier talks about it. When you've got a natural resource like oil, you really do have the natural resource trap. Uh, it's really been a, a, a massive shame for a country that has such unbelievable human capital. I think we're starting to see real change inside Nigeria with a growing c crop of young leaders who are trained all around the world and want to see something different, who are exhausted by the corruption, who um, are embarrassed by Nigeria's reputation and want to see things done differently. Uh, we've just made an investment in a company named Sproxel, which is um, finding ways to use scratch-off systems to fight against the uh, counterfeit drug trade, which is so enormous, not only in Nigeria but Pakistan and India as well. And they will be having operations certainly in India and probably East Africa. Um, I've seen some really exciting investments. And so we want to invest in them, show that they work, and help turn those entrepreneurs into heroes um, in the country and around the world so that we start changing our expectations and imagination around what is possible. Um, one just funny aside is when I told our country director of Pakistan that we were going into Nigeria, he was like, Nigeria? And I was like, hey, babe, you are the last one that can throw stones. And when I tell the Nigerians we're in Pakistan, they're like, why Pakistan? I'm like, come on, you're Nigerians. Um, we know how to do this. And so I think it's that. You know, we have such preconceptions. You can get a lot done in, both, in, in these places where there's real entrepreneurial talent um, that people are, are afraid to go into. But you've got to make a long-term commitment, not just to the companies, but to the community um, and to being spokespeople. So I guess this is uh, two parts, but I think I can ask this on behalf of a lot of students here who are interested in going into social entrepreneurship. Um, so one um, are the skills and personality that a social entrepreneur has. Um, can that be um, taught, or is that something you're just born with? And second, um, if it is something that can be taught, then what are those skills? Um. I do think there's a specific, forget about social entrepreneur, entrepreneurial personality. Um, I'm not sure it's what you're necessarily born with, but I think you get trained pretty early on. When you look at, I was just interviewed, interestingly, for a book on social entrepreneurship. And Dr. Yunus was interviewed, and Bill Drayton, and many others who are much more, uh, hugely much more accomplished than I am. But when the guy asked me, uh, to talk about my life. I said, when I was six, and he said, stop right there. And I said, why? And he said, every single one of you, and now I've interviewed 12 of you, talked about when I was six, <laughs> which is really interesting. Um, and if you look at most social entrepreneurs, you know, Bill Drayton was, started a school newspaper when he was 10 years old, and I was pretty much running a project in every school I was in and selling Christmas ornaments so I could go on ski trips. And we were all entrepreneurs as kids. So there is an entrepreneurial personality that has no choice but to build something, create something. 
and we're not very good employees. Um, there's real truth in that because we're breaking the rules. Um, that said, I do think you, there are different traits that you can cultivate, um, like the, the, the dreaming of what the world could be instead of what the world is. Um, really being stubborn. You are going to get there no matter what. And if you fall down a hundred times, you just get right back up and you do it again. Um, storytelling. Because you've got to convince people to do things they don't want to do and don't want to see. And so you better be able to tell a story so that, that they can see themselves in so that they will be with you in doing it. Team building. Um, I think the biggest uh, failure entrepreneurs have is because they often have charismatic personalities, they think they can build things. And most of them can't manage themselves out of a bag. And so they've got to be able to work with people who are really good managers or they're not going to be able to build. And I actually think one of the major weaknesses in the social entrepreneurship sector is that we adulate and celebrate the entrepreneur. And we forget that often more important than the entrepreneur is often the senior team. On my team, um, Anne McDougall, who runs our operations, Brian Trellstad, who runs our investments, Sasha Dichter, who works on our fundraising, they really are the core that then works with all these other people to make the work happen. And there would be no acumen with that then. There'd just be lots of really interesting dreams and stories. And I think we need to do better as a world at find ways of s celebrating the builders. And if, you, if your personality is a builder, if you love to be an architect, if you love to make dreams of, of whoever happen, that's a really legitimate role to have in this space. And um, the more self-aware you are, the more you're going to be able to do and the more meaning you're going to be able to find. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Last question. I guess take it right here. <laughs> um, you s said before that microfinance doesn't always work well, and recently there's been some criticism with um, the spate of suicides in relation to people not getting, like who were given too many loans. Uh, and India recently added some reforms, I think at the start of this month, they went into action. Where would you like to see those kinds of systems go? And do you see them as complementing Acumen's work? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I said that microfinance doesn't always work. It's more, what I, what, what I would say is that I think microfinance is a key um, part of our financial sector and one that we need to develop more. It's been largely unregulated. Um, I think it's unfair to link the farmer suicides to microfinance. Um, there's a really complicated dynamic happening, particularly in Gujarat um, and Maharashtra, where you're seeing most of them. It's too easy to say these are the smallholder farmers. Some of these farmers have 10 acres. Um, it's too easy to blame it all on the microfinance banks. Um, many of them have loans from traditional banks. That's that's a story of shame. That's a story of not knowing what your place is in society anymore. That's a story of poorly placed credit, too, that could have come from money lenders, that could have come from microfinance. And so we need to look at, we need to unpack that over here. Where microfinance has gone astray, when it has, um, is when it is being looked at simply as a financial, um, a financial asset without any moral or social cause. I was um, called a number of years back now, and that was the moment when I thought we were in trouble as a sector. Um, the guy was from a Swiss bank. They just created a fund of funds that was going to focus on microfinance. They clearly need a woman on it that would provide some level of legitimacy. And, um, and the way he tried to pitch me was that our fund of funds is going to have the highest financial rate of return of any instrument in the world. And I was like, are you listening to yourself? We're talking about the poorest people on the planet. And your pitch is we're going to get really, really rich. You've got to like rework that, babe, if you want you know, legitimate people sitting on your board. There's a, that's the problem, that we go, f we want easy solutions. We want easy roads. So we say, wow, people actually pay back. 99% they pay back. Well, there's a reason people pay back. You know, they feel this social cohesion. As soon as they think you're j just there for the money, 
well, why should I pay you back? Look at subprime, same thing happened. That wasn't microfinance, but it was still, it, when it starts getting dominated more by greed than by change, we need to look at it. We need to regulate it. Most of the microfinance organizations I know are not dominated by that. They are started and run by well-meaning people who truly believe that part of the solution is getting people access to another good or service they need to make change. So what I would do, regulation but not, again, it's so complicated because it's too easy to say, let's regulate. But you look at what's happening in Andhra Pradesh where Acumen does a lot of work in India, it's really politicized. So the government officials want to come in and they want to control it for their use. That we got to kind of pull back and be much more transparent, which I think the internet's going to give us an opportunity to do. But regulate in a way that we look at social metrics and celebrate and reward those organizations that are making the most change and are not just financially sustainable. I think we'll get there, but I think it's the next generation, it's not this generation. Very good way to end. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much.